Life Church Online. What's going on? We're excited to have you join us here today. I want to cover a couple of things on how you can stay engaged with us throughout this service. One thing I want you to know about is our chat box. We have hosts that are standing by ready to get to know you. You can take notes and email them to yourself afterwards. Follow along with our Bible, any scriptures that are used. We got live prayer that you can go into a private room and speak with someone privately about any needs that are upon your heart. Our desire is that you feel like the Freedom Life family because that's exactly who you are. So right now, without any further ado, we're excited to see what God has planned today. guys as you are making your way back to your seat make sure you turn around and look at the camera and let's welcome everyone that's watching online today we are so excited that you guys could join us today but today we get to celebrate something incredible we get to celebrate baptisms let's let's cheer it on for baptisms if you are getting baptized will you come meet me on the stage Yeah, we have two individuals that have said yes to baptisms today. So I'm going to ask them their name, and then you guys are going to head on out to get baptized. Katie. Russell. All right, guys, let's cheer it up for them and congratulate them. And as they are making their way out, I'm going to ask all of us in here to turn our attention to the screen. We have an incredible announcement from our senior pastor, Freddie. Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, as you know, my wife and I are out of town on an extended vacation for a few weeks. So excited to do that. It did make me think about something, though, thinking about how as a church family over the summer, it's common for a lot of us to take some time away. And in doing so, often summer has become a stretch for the, just the vibrancy and the, and the continued vision moving forward of the church. So my wife and I did a lot of planning before we left so that while we're gone for a few weeks, everything will continue to flow. And that got me thinking about our church as a whole. So I just want to share my heart with you for a second, if I could. During the summer, as we face these challenges, we always think about what it means to be a family around the ideas of serving, praying, and giving. So if you are already on a serving rotation, one of the things that we ask about over the summer, because a lot of folks are you know in and out, is if you would add one week to whatever your normal serving rotation is over the course of the summer just that one extra week from every person on the schedule will actually fill all the spots that take place over the summertime I know I've got a great team of teachers who are stepping in and our staff has talked about how they will you know step into my absence and I'm totally comfortable with that but I was just wondering if we could extend that challenge to the entire church on the second part of our emphasis in the church is prayer we all come together to pray one of the things that we've seen is a move of God like crazy and I believe it's directly related to these pre-service prayer times. So every week before every service, 45 minutes ahead of the service, we begin gathering in the sanctuary for a time of intercessory prayer. If you've never made it to one of those, let me just tell you what it's like. It's unstructured. Uh, some people sit very quietly the whole time. Sometimes people get on the mic and share a word for the room. Sometimes we walk through a rhythm of topics. But it's different every time because we want it to be spirit-led. We always have a staff person that facilitates it, but it really is driven by the people there. If you've never made it to one, I'd love to encourage you this summer. Would you join us for one of our uh, pre-service prayer times 45 minutes before any of the weekend services? Uh, the last part is giving. One of the things that, that we used to have happen over the summer as a church is during the summertime and as everybody's on vacation, financially, it would like throw us into turmoil. We would be like, oh no, because you know, we'd be out of town. And I know for my wife and I, it's important to give whether we're here or not. So if you've not considered it, I would invite you to consider joining my wife and I in automated giving. We went online, we signed up through the app, and we know that whether we're in Italy or wherever we are, uh, our tithe is gonna go to the storehouse because we want to make sure first we're honoring God with our finances. And you know, the Proverbs 11, 24 tells us the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of stingy gets smaller and smaller. Uh, we get to walk in the blessing of that. We're enjoying some of that right now, and we're excited about that. And I want to invite all of you to consider over the summer as you are traveling around, uh, if you've never thought about it, maybe a step towards automated giving would be a step for you. All right, serve, pray, give. We can do it together. We can do more together than any of us could do apart. I love you guys. I'll see you after June 19th. Until then, 
I won't see you and you won't hear from me. <laughs> bye bye. How incredible. So I know you guys didn't come to hear me talk, so make sure you pay attention at the end of service. Pastor James is going to give us our top three announcement. But before that, who is excited to worship the Lord today? Who is excited to hear what the Lord gave Pastor James? All right, guys, if you all will join me in prayer, then we'll get started. Father, we just thank you for how good you are. We take a moment to just pause and just be still in your presence. Father, we submit to you. Holy Spirit, come in, wreck us, and do what only you, to do, you can do. We are so excited. Father, we just welcome you with open arms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Freedom Life. Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord? Father, we're so glad that we get to worship you. Father, can we just, or guys, can we just speak these truths of our life?
rushing over us The tide is rising, rising
before the Lord and he will lift you up. We want to see God's kingdom come here right now. But God's instruction is that we've got to humble ourselves. His instruction is very simple that I've got to be willing to humble my weak before him. I've got to be willing to humble my insecurities before him. I've got to be willing to humble all of my issues before him. I've got to be willing to press just a little bit more. I've got to be willing to humble myself before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because then that's when he lifts me up. That's when my problems don't, don't even matter anymore. That's when the things that I've been walking through, the struggles that I've been looking at, don't hold weight anymore because I'm magnifying the King of Kings. And as I maximize him, my problems minimize. I just want to invite us today just to a time that we would be willing to submit to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning. Let's pray together. Father, that you would be lifted high. That today, Lord, we would be willing to slow down and hear from you. Lord, that we would be willing to humble all of our stuff right here at your altar. Lord, that everything we brought in here with us, we would be willing to humble that. The argument we had right before church, that we would be willing to humble that. The issue that we've been walking through all week, Lord, that we would be willing to humble that before you. The marital discord that we've been struggling through this past month, that we would be willing to humble that before you. The sickness that we've been carrying with us, and it seems to be getting the best of us, Lord, we ask that we would humble that before you, and that you would lift us up. God, that you would renew our hearts, that you would renew our minds. That today we would be a people that are lifted up, lifted up to go and do the work of advancing your kingdom. Lord, that we would be the ones allowing the kingdom of heaven to touch earth. That the kingdom of heaven through us would begin to touch our families. That it would begin to touch our homes. That it would begin to touch our lives, Lord. That we would not leave here weak and despair and, and hopeless and helpless. But we would leave here knowing that the King of kings and the Lord of lords has already won the battle. And Lord, you've given us everything we need if we would just submit to you. So Father, we submit to you today. I submit my words to you. I submit my heart to you, Lord. That I would just be your mouthpiece for your heart. God, that you would get the glory out of us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Um, my name is James. I am the Family Ministries Pastor here. Um, I'm excited today uh, to preach today in this text. We are diving in to the book of James. This is our last pretty much installment of this series. And I absolutely love the book of James. Um, not just that's because it's my name, but I, I love the book of James because James is a guy who's a man after my own heart. James gets straight to the point. Like, I, I'm like I, I'll tell you a little bit about myself later, but I don't like a whole lot of the fluff and all of the other stuff. Just tell me what it is. Just get to the point. And James is one of those guys, he gets straight to the point. He's not easily impressed. 
I love James because James is the brother of Jesus, and there's not a whole lot of things that impress James. He's more impressed not with the impressive, but he's impressed with the important. You've got to understand that James was the brother of Jesus who didn't even believe in Jesus. He heard Jesus' sermons. He saw Jesus do some miracles, but he was not impressed. He was not moved by Jesus. I mean, imagine this is the brother of Jesus, and everybody's running around saying Messiah and Rabbi and Master. And James is probably thinking, man, I saw you working at the carpentry shop, and you came home with the carpentry shop and sat down at the dinner table, and you stunk just like the rest of us. James wasn't really impressed with Jesus. He saw James or Jesus doing these miracles, and he's probably looking at Jesus' leadership techniques and questioning, like, how are you going to save the world, Jesus, with a bunch of rejects? You got fishermen that don't even know how to fish. You, You got these guys handling your money, and they're stealing from you. Why would you do this? And so James is not easily impressed. But something happens to James. After Jesus goes to the cross and is resurrected, something happens to James. See, he watches his brother do the thing that he said he was going to come and do. And something happens to James. He heard all of Jesus' sermons. But James wasn't impressed with the sermons. He was impressed by the sacrifice. So we get the legitimacy of our scripture here. Scholars would say that we get the legitimacy of our scripture because Jesus' brother James actually says, now I believe. Now I actually believe. And so James actually takes out some of the guesswork. James pushes aside our Christian ego, and it feels a little uncomfortable when you read this book because James is not interested in Christianese. He's not interested in trying to make you feel good. He's not interested in all of the fluff. James is saying, listen, I've watched my brother do this, and if you want to be like my brother, this is what you should do. James is advocating for integrity and honesty. There's something to be said about integrity, that people are not impressed with our sermons. They're impressed by our sacrifice. What is the thing that you are trying to get across to people? What's the message that you're trying to preach to people? I wonder if if you would decide to actually walk your talk, people might actually believe it more. Uh, somebody said that, you know, what you're saying, what you're doing is so loud that I can't hear what you're saying. And James wants us to understand that we've got to be people of integrity and we've got to do what Jesus did. And so if you've been trekking with us for the last couple of weeks, we've been covering the first couple of chapters of James. And all you have to do if you've missed any of it is go to flconline.org and you can look at some of our archives, some of our old message messages, and you can stay up to date in this series. Week one, James encouraged us through chapter one to stand with confidence. Week two, we were encouraged to serve with compassion. And so week three, today, we're going to end off this series and talk about submitting to God. Submit to God. I love the book of James because this is wisdom literature. So James dives into this book of wisdom, and scholars would say that James is the Proverbs of the New Testament. So if you've ever read Proverbs, if you've ever, you know, just had a chance to dive into that book, you know that it's filled with wisdom. It's filled with principles. But the thing about wisdom is it's not necessarily wise until you use it. It's the same thing with these principles that James is saying, you don't necessarily have to do this, but if you do, your life will be so much better. You don't necessarily have to follow what he's saying, but if you do, your life will will be much better. And so James gives us some principles. And I'm just going to warn you guys that I'm not going to be able to cover everything in this text. So if you want to stay up to date, if you want to stay trekking with us, go to Digging Deeper on Wednesday nights right here in our campus at 630, or you can even do that online to stay current. Just go to our Digging Deeper. But what I want to focus on today is this topic of submitting to God. And so James pretty much captures all of chapter 4 and chapter 5, and I believe it captures the heart of this book in this one verse, James 4.10. Let's go there again. 
This is the principle. James says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So I know a lot of you are Bible scholars and you guys are really good Christians, but I struggle with this verse. See, there's a a couple problems that I have with this verse. Problem number one is this. Being humble is hard. I don't know if you've noticed that, but being humble is hard. Like James says, if you're humble, you'll be lifted up. And I want to kind of push back at James and say, James, I love being humbled. I really do love being humble. Like, I, I, I don't really, really like being humble, but I love being lifted up. I love being important. I, I love being significant. I love being the talk of the town. I love being the center of attention sometimes. I, I love hearing your amens. I love hearing your applause. I love getting the accolades. Of course, I want the promotion. Of course, I want more money. Of course, I want to be the top of my class. Of course, I want to do those things. I love being lifted up. My problem is being humble. And maybe you would agree with me. Maybe you won't agree with me. But I'm just going to be vulnerable before you for a second that I love being lifted up, but I don't necessarily like being humbled. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking, of le- th- it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And I would push back on C.S. Lewis and say, hold on, man, I I, I understand what you're saying, but I like thinking of myself. I actually prefer to think of myself more than anybody else. Maybe y'all not going to be honest with me, but I'll just keep going. James is saying in chapter 4 that the reason that there's fights among us, the reason that there's quarrels among us, the reason why we keep struggling with things, the reason why we go back and forth with ourselves, the reason why we're struggling with this dualism, this duality that we say we want to do something and then we don't do that thing, the reason why we are at war with others and the reason why we're at war with God, the reason why we're at war with ourselves is because we want what we want. Amen? We want what we want. And not only humility is hard because I want what I want, but not only do I want what I want, I want what I want when I want it. And I want it how I like it. So James goes in a little bit more. You know, one of the dumbest statements I heard growing up, this used to make me so upset. Maybe you guys understand this, but this statement really used to get under my skin because people would look at you with this smug look and they would look at you like, oh, I just outdid you or this look of condemnation. And they would say this statement, they'd say something like, oh, you want to have all your cake and eat it too. Yes, I want all of my cake. The whole purpose of me making the cake was for me to eat it. If I did not want to eat the cake, I would not have made the cake. I wouldn't have invited you over to eat the cake with me. Of course I want to have my cake and eat it too. But maybe, maybe let me explain it to you a little bit more. Let me be a little vulnerable with you. Um, James is talking about we want what we want when we want it. And so I'm just going to make a few statements here. And you don't have to raise your hand. Do me a favor. Don't raise your hand to this. I'll be vulnerable for you. You don't have to nudge the person next to you. You don't have to text, hey, did you get that? Don't do that. I just want you to listen, and if this kind of resonates with you, you can write it down in your notes. You can even give a little head nod. Whatever you decide to do is fine. But here's the statements that really capture this text but also captures my heart. Listen, I want relationship without commitment. That's just me. I I want relationship without commitment. I I don't want to be lonely I, I, I like having friends. I love people. I just don't want the responsibility of having to text all the time or call all the time or check on you all the time and all the introverts are saying amen. I want relationship without commitment. Some of you probably heard this another way. Like, hey, girl, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just trying to be with you. Like, I just want to be with you, but I don't necessarily want to commit. Like, I, I got to get all my stuff together before I commit. Ladies, since we're on this topic, since I have a chance to talk about this for a second, if you ever see a man come at you like, yo, I'm just trying, you know, I'm just trying, walk the other way. Just just leave immediately. It will save you a lot of heartache, a lot of pain. Trust me. Relationship without commitment. (laughs) 
Let me keep going for a second. <laughs> I want pleasure without conviction or guilt. I want my cake, all of my cake. I want to eat my cake when I want to eat my cake, how I want to eat my cake, with whom I want to eat my cake with, and I don't want to gain a pound while I eat it. I want it all to myself. I want what I want when I want it. And the thing is, I don't want to hurt my family in the process. I want to want what I want, and I want to receive what I want without ruining my marriage. I want what I want without jeopardizing my job. I want without what I want without being the next scandal on the news. I want what I want when I want it and how I want it. I want pleasure without conviction or guilt. I also, let me just keep going since we're, we're here. I want the benefits of work without the demands of labor. Hey, listen, my, my boss is on vacation right now, so I can tell you guys. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> some days I just want to come to work and I just want to get paid. I don't want to do a whole lot of work sometimes. Some of y'all say, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I I'll leave it. We're going to stop on that one. This last one, though, maybe you understand. I want you to see me as perfect so I don't have to risk you being disappointed with me. I want to be the perfect pastor. I want you to see me as the perfect spouse. I want you to see me as the perfect parent. I need you to see me as the perfect student. I need you to see me as the perfect friend so that you are not disappointed with me and I don't risk you rejecting me. I, I need to walk around like I've got everything together. I, everybody can see that I'm struggling. You know that you're struggling, but I would rather walk around like everything is cool. I'm blessed and highly favored. Amen, sister than to tell you that I'm struggling because I need you to see me as perfect because I don't want to risk you rejecting me. And so James is saying that, hey, we love being lifted up. The problem is I just don't like being humble. See, being humble means I need to give up something of myself. I've got to give up something I want. And the problem is I want what I want when I want it. That leads me to problem number two. First off, I want what I want, what I want it. And problem number two is often what God wants and what I want are two different things. See, we often, when we look at what God wants, we kind of have a skewed view of what God wants. See, we often view God's wants through the lens of the men that raised us. We often view what God wants through the lens of the father that was there or wasn't there. We view him through the lens of being a tyrant. We view him through the lens of being abusive. We view him through the lens of being negligent. We view him through the lens of being passive. We view him through the lens of being distant. The only time they showed up was to get something that they wanted. The only time that they were around was to betray us or to hurt us or to do the things that they wanted when they wanted and how they wanted and so we often view God through that same lens, but God begins to show us that that's not who he is. James is coming from a perspective that he's not interested in that view of God. What he's giving us is a real view of God. And so God shows us exactly who he is and what he wants through this story in the Bible. He shows us through his son, Jesus. And Jesus tells us very simply what God wants when he prays. Jesus says, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's what God wants. His ruling authority to operate on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is this perfect place. It's the picture of perfection where evil doesn't exist, where pain doesn't exist, where racism doesn't exist. There's no celebration of sin and there's no basher or bashing of the celebrators. There's no senseless murders. There's no mindless perversion. Heaven is a place where insecurity has no place. Heaven is a place where fear has no place. Heaven is a place where joy abounds and love is full and grace is thick and freedom is everywhere and peace paves the pavements. Heaven is a perfect place. Not because it's some magical kingdom that we pay too much money for, but heaven is the perfect place because of who rules it. 
Heaven is perfect because God has full authority to do what he wants there. Heaven is perfect because God can do what he wants. He's allowed to actually move there. But see, there's this strange contrast. See, when I get what I want, I find some things that I don't often get what I'm looking for. It's weird that when I get what I want, I finally get the thing that I want, and I realize, I don't really want this. Like, I find the thing that I want, and then I realize this is not enough, so I need something more. And so I go back to that something more, and then I end up wanting more of that. But that's not enough, so I go back to someone else. And I go back to that someone else thinking that this is going to solve it. And so I go from relationship to relationship, from jump off to jump off, from this place to that place. And I keep going and going and going, and at the end of it, I'm like, this ain't what I wanted. This ain't what I was looking for. So when I get what I want, I don't usually get what I'm looking for. And the crazy thing is I usually don't get what I need either. I usually leave empty. But when God gets what he wants, we get freedom. We get deliverance. We get peace. We get joy. We get love. We get intimacy. We get significance. When God gets what he wants, it's weird that we get freedom from addictions that we didn't even know we could have. When God gets what he wants, we get intimacy that we never thought we could experience. When God gets what he wants, we get peace that we never thought was possible. When I give God what he wants, I usually receive everything I need. James says in this principle, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. See, you don't have to do this principle. You don't have to live by it. But if you do, your life will be so much better. James is saying that if you want to stop struggling with the same stuff, if you want to stop going back to the same stuff, if you want to stop being at war with yourself and stop being at war with everyone else, if you want to stop being at war with God, he says the key, the solution is submit to God. Say yes to God. Surrender to God. Humble yourselves before God. When God gets what he wants, we usually get what we need. And so James does a great job, and we're going to kind of move through this kind of quick, that James shows us how to submit to God. I don't want to try to present something here and then it's like, well, how do we do this? Like, if you spent some time with me, you know I like things to be super practical. I guess I'm a lot like James in this book that I want to get straight to the point. So James is saying how we submit to God Point number one, if we're going to submit to God, we've got to practice submitting. The thing is, it doesn't just happen. It's not just something that we wake up, oh, I'm submitted to God. No, it's something that you have to work through. It's something that you have to actively do. It's something that you have to practice. Here's what James says here in James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I know for some of you that sounded kind of harsh. But James' is intent, his intent is not to be harsh. His intent is to get to the point. His intent is to cut through the fat and to get right to the meat. What he's trying to say is we've got to submit. This word submit that James is talking about is a military term that refers to being in your proper rank. Submission means being in your proper rank. And James is saying if we're going to submit to God, if we're going to practice submitting to God, we've got to agree with God, with what God says. We've got to submit to God by being in our proper rank. It's saying yes to the ruling authority. It's saying yes to the ruling authority. So here's the devil's scheme. Let me kind of expose it for you for a second. The devil's scheme is very simple. His mission, first of all, is to steal, kill, and destroy. But his scheme is to get us to question our rank. His scheme is to get us to break our proper rank. And so he wants us to say yes to things that should not be our ruling authority. He wants us to say yes to the wrong things. But here's what the devil knows. He knows that we won't openly say no to God. He knows that. We all live in the Bible Belt. This is Virginia. He knows that we won't openly say no to God. We just say yes to things other than God. 
That's all he's doing. We're going to say yes to things other than God. I won't say openly no to God. I'll be coming to church every Sunday, and I'll make sure I lift my hands at the right time, but I'll keep saying yes to going back to that website. I'll keep saying yes to getting back in that bed again. I'll keep saying yes to being in that argument with that person and having that bad attitude that I carry around and everybody knows about. I'll keep saying yes to that financial struggle. I'll just keep saying yes to that argument. I'll keep saying yes to that anger problem. I'll keep saying yes to my temper. And when I get to the end of it, I realize that I didn't get what I was looking for. And when I get to the end of it, I realize that I was saying yes unintentionally to the devil and his schemes. I get so caught up saying yes. See, the devil, he's so crafty. It's, it's very simple that we, the scripture says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And so what the devil wants us to kind of be uh, confused about is that we are near the throne. But the devil wants us to think that we should be on the throne. Yeah. That's a struggle. So James is saying at this text, what James is getting at in in chapter 4 is that we've got to stop playing games. We've got to stop the the spiritual judo and the Christian karate and all of the craziness. We've got to stop trying to get what we want when we want it and sprinkle a little God on it. We've got to get serious, he says. Wash your hands. Purify your hearts. He's saying get serious and submit to God. Say yes. To the ruling authority. That's what he's saying. See, when we say yes to one thing, we're ultimately saying no to other things. I don't have to fight the devil by saying, not today, devil. I don't, I don't need to do that. Because the thing is, I don't need to say no to the devil. I just need to say yes to God. It's very simple. See, but in order to say yes, I've got to know what he says. If I'm going to say yes to God's word, I've got to know and spend some time working through and realizing it for myself what this word says. See, in this word is his character. In this word is his authority, his story, his promises. And if I'm going to battle the devil, I need to know what the word says. I need to know what God says about me. And there are times where I need to make sure that I'm agreeing with his word. And how I agree with his word is by reminding myself of what it says. When I'm struggling with my provision, I can go back to what David says in this word. And David says, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches. I know this word because I've had to walk through it, not because I'm special, but because I need to remind myself daily of what this word says. It does not just happen. We have to practice it. Every morning, Lord, I'm feeling a little insecure today. Well, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Every morning, the devil will try to tell you, no, you don't deserve to be here. You're not enough. And the Lord says, no, yes, you are my workmanship. I'm working some things out in your life. You need to be reminded of his word. We've got to stop entertaining the devil and just say yes to God. Just say yes to his word. If I had a little bit of time, I would tell you guys that I've spent some time with my daughters, and I'm trying to get them to practice this too, that every night before bed, we have this affirmation we say. And it's very simple. I'm beautiful. I'm strong. I'm courageous. God loves me. I will love others. I, and my, my daughters are probably reciting it right at this moment. I will love others, and, and I will use my gifts from Jesus. And it goes on and on and on. And see, what I'm trying to get them to do is I'm trying to get them to remind themselves of what God says about them. Some of us are thinking that our situation is final, that the depression is final, that this disease is final, that this hurt is final, that the pain is final. But all you've got to do is go back to the word and he says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. When I'm walking through those dark times, when I'm walking through those lonely times, I know that my God is a God who meets me in the valley of the shadow of death. I know that my God is my light and my salvation, so I don't have room to be afraid. I know God's word because I need to try it and practice it for myself. We've got to practice it. Point number two that James leads us to is we've got to practice knowing his word. We've got to practice saying yes to God. The other point is we've got to be 
patient. Be patient. I know that's hard. But James is saying we've got to be patient. Here's what he says in verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. We're going to jump down to verse 11. As you know, we count as blessed those who've persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord's finally brought about. Finally worked out. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. I want to show you guys something just into this point that in order to be patient, in order to submit to God, we've got to trust that he's working it out. My mama may not be working it out. This thing on my job might not be doing what I want it to do, but I need to trust that he's working it out. Let me show you a quick picture of, of someone special. So uh, two days ago, Friday, was uh, my wife and I's 10-year anniversary, and so we celebrated 10 years of marriage. Amen. 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 Man, and as I look at this picture, um, there were so many things that I was like, man, this is, this is cool. This is awesome. People were like, oh, great, great, great. And what people were saying was like, man, y'all look exactly the same. And I'm like, we sure do. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we've been working at that. You know, but then the insecure part of me looks at this picture and said, man, we still look the same. Nothing has changed. I still look the same. And what happens is some of us, we get so discouraged and we get so frustrated because we look at pictures of ourselves and we allow other people's view of ourselves to determine how God is working in our lives and we get a little frustrated. Well, I've been going to church. I've been submitting to God. I've been saying yes to him, but nothing's changed. That situation on my job hasn't changed. That situation in my marriage hasn't changed. That thing that I've been walking through hasn't changed, and we get frustrated. But let me encourage you really quick. See, what you don't see in this picture is our heartbreak. What you don't see in this picture are the tears we cry. What you don't see in this picture are the disappointments that we have. What you don't see in this picture are the struggles that we've walked through. And the enemy would allow us to get stuck there. But what you don't also see in this picture is how God showed up. What you also don't see in this picture is how he's made a way. What you also do not see in this picture are the three miracles that are sitting on that front row right now. What you don't see in this picture is how he's been changing our hearts. What you don't see in this picture is how he's been changing our attitudes. What you don't see in this picture is how he's been growing us. Listen, I want you to understand this. You've got to hear this. I'm looking at this picture. Don't let someone's picture of you discourage you from the process that God has you in. That's your process. God is working some things out in your life. God is working it out. As a matter of fact, why don't you poke that person or look at that person next to you and say, he's working it out. He's working it out. I know that you're walking through some things. I know that you're dealing with some things that seem like nothing has changed. Well, I haven't gone anywhere in my career. I haven't gotten anywhere in my relationships. I haven't moved anywhere in, in my, my spiritual walk. But you've got to understand that the Lord is working out. There are some things that you will not see the fruit of until the next season. There's some things that we are so stuck on the episode ending that we don't realize that there's another season coming. This is the season finale for that season, and there's a season premiere for the new one. The Lord is working it out. He is working it out. But here's what I need you to understand. Don't, don't hear me wrong. If the Lord is working it out, that means we're saying yes to his process and not our own. If we're saying yes to his process, not our own, what that means is that I, I can't just curse somebody out and then go back to Facebook and say, I'm in process. No, no, no. That means because he's working it out, I, I curse that person out because I'm still in process, but I now go back and I apologize to that person. And then I say he's working it out. 
It doesn't mean that I can just sit here in isolation anymore. It doesn't mean that I can just sit here by myself, but it means that I'm willing to be vulnerable. I'm willing to risk some things because I know that the Lord is working it out. I know that he's moving, and so I'm going to call that person that I've been avoiding because I know he's working it out. I I can push a little bit longer in this job because I know he's working it out. I I know that things are not final in this situation because he's working it out. I don't know if there's anybody here who's experienced experience God working it out. Some of the old saints, some of the old saints used to say, and I loved it, I'm not where I used to be, or I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. He's working it out. There's some folks that came here, you drove some miles, you you decided to tune in online just to hear this, that the God of the universe is working it out for you. He's working it out. So James is saying you've got to realize that we've got to practice this thing. You're going to have to wake up every morning and practice this thing. And point number two, James is saying we've got to to actually realize that he's working it out. There's a process to it. It takes some patience. It doesn't just happen overnight. Don't get so caught up in somebody else's story that now you're trying to live your life by that. James is saying, but there's something more. And I want us to lean into this in a little bit of time we have left. James says... And point number three, that if we're going to submit to God, we've got to say yes to praying with and for his people. Check this out in James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. That's another way of praying. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I used to think that prayer was just a private act. I just thought that prayer was just all about me and God. You ever heard people say, well, that's just between me and God. I thought that that was the case. And I would even say things like this. Maybe you've said it before. I'm praying about it. That statement is really the biggest cop out of all times because what we mean when we say I'm praying about it is that I'm going to do absolutely nothing about the situation that I'm encountering. I'm praying about it just means that I'm going to stay stuck where I am. I'm not going to move any further. I'm just going to pray about it because it's just between me and God, and that means I don't have to change. But James is saying something different here. He makes this weird connection between prayer and people. He says in verse 16, or he says, therefore. And so whenever we see a therefore, we have to look back at the Scripture and see what it's there for. He says, okay, are you hurting? Do you have trouble? Are you sick? Do you need help with something? Are you happy? Do you need a friend? Is something going on in your life? He says, well, therefore, confess it to each other and pray for each other, and there you will be healed. Prayer is not an act of isolation, but it's an invitation to accountability. James is saying that there are some things that you cannot heal from until you tell someone. Some of us are walking through some of the darkest times in our lives, and we're saying, I'm just going to pray about it. Well, let me push you a little bit further to say, as you pray, make your way to that counselor as well. As you're praying, make your way to that life group as well, because James is making this connection that we cannot pray without people. There's something connected with prayer and people. There are some things that you are struggling with that you do not have to struggle with anymore if somebody would just touch and agree with you. James is saying that transparency and accountability is the key to being healed. Some of us are just trying to power through. Some of us are just trying to read another book. Some of us are just trying to move mountains and do all this stuff. I got faith to move mountains. You do. You do. But James is also saying that none of that stuff can happen if you don't have anybody in your life to connect with, if you don't have relationships to keep you accountable. Even Jesus, the God of the universe, rolled with 12 guys. You've got to be accountable. See, here's what it is. The devil loves for us to stay stuck in isolation. Because in isolation, I get what I want, what I want, when I want it, and how I want it, even if it's just in my mind, and even if it's just for a minute. See, what that does is it makes me the ruling authority of my life. 
And because I'm the ruling authority, then I become responsible for the change. But James is saying that's not the case with God. You don't have to be the ruling authority in your life. Let God do it. Let him be the change agent and you just do what he's telling you to do. Here's what James says. He says, then you will be healed. Every time we see this word to be healed, we also see the kingdom following behind it. All you have to do is go to the Gospels and you'll see that whenever we see healing right before it or even after it, there's something, there's talk about the kingdom. The calling card of the kingdom is healing. There's healing. And so when we pray with others, we're not just venting or gossiping or complaining, but we are being vulnerable enough to ask the God of the universe to allow his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray with others, we are saying, would you come to my job as you did in heaven? Would you be in my home as it is in heaven? Would you be in my marriage as it is in heaven? Would you meet me in this struggle, Lord, as it is in heaven? Would you give me the healing? that I'm looking for as you're doing it in heaven. Would you be the ruling authority in my life? When we pray for others, we're giving God what he wants. When we pray with and for others, there's some of us, and I have to spend a little time with this, there's some of us who are missing out on some healing because we refuse to humble ourselves and call that mentor. There's some of us that are missing out on deliverance because we refuse to go and humble ourselves and join that life group. There's some of us that are missing out on some healing, some freedom, because we are so proud that we think we can do it by ourselves and we refuse to go and see that counselor. The Lord is saying, I'm not impressed with that. I'm not impressed with you just pushing through. I've given you people in your life. I've put people in your life so that you can be healed. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Healing happens, check this out, healing happens through intercession and not isolation. Intercession, not isolation. Humble yourselves before the Lord and then you will be lifted up. What are you leaving on the table because you refuse to be humble? What are we leaving on the table because we refuse to be humble? Would you stand on your feet with me? There's a sense here. And we've got to realize this principle only works if we do it. Wisdom is not wise if we don't use it. And James is giving us some wisdom here that in order to be more like Jesus, we've got to submit to God's will. Jesus even did it. He says, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And what Jesus did in a moment changed our lives for the rest of our lives. I want you to understand that just for a second. There are some of, think about the, the, the Israelites. They had spent 400 years trying to figure this thing out. 400 years, 40 years in the desert, 40 years here doing all of this stuff, trying to figure it out. And Jesus did in three days what they couldn't do in 400 years. All I'm saying is that when we submit to God, when we give him what he wants, we wind up getting what we need. So as we are... As we're standing here together, I believe that this is an invitation where God is inviting us to say yes to some things. God is inviting us to say yes to some healing. God is inviting us to say yes to some freedom. God is inviting us to say yes to some new lifestyles, some new routines, some new community. God is inviting us to say yes, but God wants his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. But in order to experience it, you and I have to say yes. We have to respond with the yes. And so as we're standing here, if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've kind of walked this life by yourself, you've kind of, maybe this is your first time at church or your first time at church in a long time, but you've never actually said yes to Jesus. And today you said, you know what, I give up. I'm done playing the mental games. I'm done doing spiritual judo. I'm, I'm done trying to figure this thing out on my own. I just want to say yes And I want Jesus to come into my heart today. If that's you, would you slip up your hand? I just want to say yes to Jesus. I see your hand. Amen. Amen. I just want to say yes to Jesus. Yep, I see you. I see you. I want to say yes. I want to say yes. I want to encourage you, too, that you're not alone. And the reason why I didn't have us close our eyes and bow our heads like, you know, we typically do is because we don't follow that rule anyway. Most of us, our eyes are open. 
But the reason why I didn't invite you to bow your heads or close your eyes, because I want us to now be the family of God. If you've seen somebody around you who's raised their hand to submit and say yes to that moment, I want you to look at them. I want you to grab their hand. I want you to pray with them. You don't have to wait for the pastor to give some magical word. I, I've got nothing special. Here's the other thing I want to make a call to as we get ready to, to pray. Maybe you've been walking as a Christian for a minute. Maybe you just started this journey together and you're saying, man, I'm just struggling with submission. I want to invite our prayer partners here just for a moment. I've been struggling with submission. I don't know how to do this thing. I, I, I'm, I'm really struggling on what my next steps are. I'm frustrated because every time I get to some place, it's just not working out. Some of us are walking through some really difficult financial struggles right now. Some of us are walking through some really difficult emotional battles and mental battles right now. And if that's you today and you're saying, Lord, I want to submit this to you. I want to submit to your process. I want to submit to what you want to do in my life. Would you slip your hand up for that too so we can have some people pray? Amen. 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 I see your hands. I see your hands. I want to invite you to do something too. If you've raised your hand and you feel comfortable, just make your way to some of our prayer partners. Allow them to touch and agree with you. We don't have to do this thing alone. And if you're okay with just standing in your seat, that's fine too. Find somebody to pray with you right next to you. There's power in community. There's power in accountability. There's some changes. There's some healing that's happening because people are saying this. So I just want to pray with us, pray for you. If we could do something as we're about to worship, just do me a favor. Just let's lift our hands just for a second. This is a sign of surrender. This is a sign of submission. And we'll pray to God together. Lord Jesus, would you have your way today? Lord, we are excited that you have invited us to say yes. Lord, thank you for the people who said yes in baptism. Lord, thank you for the people who are saying yes to new life. Thank you for the people who are saying yes to renewed minds and renewed strength. Lord, I know that you are faithful. God, I know that you are doing something right here in this moment. Father, thank you for what you're doing. Would you bless the yeses? Would you allow us to experience your freedom, your healing? Would you allow us to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And if you're still standing here, before we go to worship, making sure that if you're online too, I want you to know that there's online prayer partners. If you need prayer, there's going to be some people in the balcony. I want you to know that you do not have to do this thing alone. Just allow God to hear you, yes.
that the Lord is renewing some marriages today, that he's renewing some minds. There's some relationships that are being mended today. There's some stories that are being rewritten today. And all we've got to do is say yes. We don't have to complicate it anymore. We don't have to try to figure it out anymore. We only have to say yes. The invitation is still here. Our prayer partners are standing right here. If you're in this moment, we've got a little bit of time. I love it. We're just going to have this be a space where we can just do some business with God. We've got a few minutes before we have to transition with our, our, you know, our family with Ivy. But we've got some time where I just want this to be a space where we can linger just a minute. If you still need prayer, then you make sure that you're doing it. And can I encourage you too that if you're a parent here, if you're married here or not married here, if you brought somebody with you here, you came in with somebody here, I just want you to grab their hand right now. Whoever, if you came here with someone, just grab their hand. 
let's really be reminded that we are not doing this thing alone. You don't have to go out here carrying the same baggage that you walked in here with. You don't have to keep worrying about this, this isolation. You can say no to the devil today. Some of us just need to know that somebody's saying yes to us as well. Saying yes to us as well. If you've, nobody grabbed your hand and you're comfortable with it, just grab the person's hands that's next to you. Let's pray together. This is, this is what community looks like. This is what family looks like. This is how we do our battles. This is how we fight through things. I don't have to do this by myself. You're not alone. I just really get the sense as we're leaning into this moment. I know I'm, I'm sorry for it, but there's some folks here are, who are feeling extreme loneliness, extreme isolation. And the Lord is saying, today I'm rewriting your story, but I need you to say yes. I need you to say yes to my process and how I'm doing it. We're just going to worship a little bit more. I'm, I'm sensing that, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to pray for us. There's a few next steps that we've got. You can check that out. Grab a, a picture of it. It'll be on our website. Some of the next steps are our VBS. At the end of the month, our VBS cookout. That's happening as well. But we also have our Digging Deeper every week. That's a way to say yes. But as we're holding hands, let's pray together. And I just want us to spend some time singing this song. If you need to leave, feel free to do that. But we're going to have a moment where we're just going to sing. And we're going to allow the Lord to fight our battles the way he wants to fight our battles. We're going to fight our battles in community. So the altar is open. Our prayer partners are up here. But I want to encourage you, don't miss this moment to say yes. Father, we are so grateful that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that we don't have to leave this place the same way we came in here. Lord, that you've given us community, that we are not alone. Lord, we are breaking the cycle and the track, this epidemic of mental health issues. We are breaking the cycle of suicide. We are going to break the cycle of depression. We are breaking the cycle of anxiety. We're breaking the cycle of worry. Lord, you're doing something new today. You are rewriting our stories. Lord, I'm praying that you lift up some counselors in our midst. I'm praying that you lift up some therapists in our midst. Lord, we are praying that you you would begin to heal our community, that you would begin to heal Hampton Roads, and you would begin to heal our world. Father, that you would do something right here in this place that the world will look at and know that the Lord is real, that he's doing something, that his kingdom is coming right here on this earth. God, I pray that we would be on our knees today as we fight this battle. We don't have to fight the battle because you've already won. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. May look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Help me say, may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. May look like I'm may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Surrounded by your grace Make and your mercy. Like I'm surrounded, surrounded but I'm surrounded by surrounded you. Surrounded by your presence. May look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. May look like I'm surrounded, may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Come on, can you make that your confession? You. It may look, may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. May look, may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Surrounded by the presence of Jesus They look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you It may look, it may look like I'm surrounded But I'm surrounded by you Surrounded by your presence Surrounded by your presence Cause you have anointed me 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 Cause you have anointed me
doesn't have to end right here. That you can take this yes into your community. You can take this yes into your home. You can take this yes into your family. We just want to make some space for our family at Ivy to come and experience the same yes that we experienced today. So all I want you to do as you're, you're making your way, we've got some prayer partners still here. They can hang out with you. We've got some folks in the back that really want to talk to you. There's just, you don't have to stop right here. But I just want to make sure that we make some room for our family to experience the same thing that we're experiencing in this moment. So we're going to bless you guys and release you. And you keep praying. You, you keep asking for yes. If you still need somebody to be warring with you and battling with you, we're still going to be here. We'll, we'll find some space. So let me just release you here. Lord, thank you for what you're doing today. Thank you for the stories that you are rewriting today. Thank you for how you're blessing us today. Thank you, God, that when we say yes to you, we're lifted up. When we humble ourselves before the Lord. You lift us up. God, I pray that we would go through this week, go into this week, not looking for our own glory, not looking to be lifted up on our own account. But, Lord, we would look to be trusting in you. And you do what only you can do, Lord. And I pray that we would take this in our homes, in our communities, our families, that the 757 would see your kingdom come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys have a great week. We love you. Hey, Freedom Life Church family. I'm excited to share something with you today. Over the past few years, God has done some incredible things here at Freedom Life Church. And one of the reasons is your giving. You have given of your time, you have given in prayer, and you have contributed financially. Well, we wanted to enhance that and make it even easier for you. So we've established a text to give feature. And it's as simple as that. On your phone, you text this number, 1-855-440-4064, and the amount you desire to give and send. It's as easy as that. Now there are a few locations that you can give to. If you simply give an amount to that number, it'll go to our general fund. But if you want to give of your tithe, you would type tithe and the amount you desire to give and send. We also have an expansion fund that if you want to give to that, just type expand and the number that you desire to give and send. We're really excited to see how this new feature can continue to enhance our partnership and to see what God does in furthering this ministry in the kingdom. So on behalf of Freedom Life Church, we thank you, we love you, and we're excited to see what God's going to do. God bless.